Я с радостью представляю сегодняшнего нашего лектора. Я думаю, что на самом деле в представлении он не очень нуждается, судя по количеству народа, которое сегодня собралось на стрелке. Это Патрик Шумахер, партнер британского архитектурного бюро Заха Хадид. Собственно, вместе с Заха Хадид Патрик работает с 1988 года, создает вместе с ней проекты в рамках направление параметрической архитектуры. Сегодня Патрик на стрелке расскажет про свою новую книгу, точнее первый том этой книги «Аутопоэзис архитектуры», самовоссоздание архитектуры, вышел в 2010 году. В начале 2012 года вышел второй том этой книжки, о которой Патрик расскажет сегодня. И также Патрик э, расскажет о том, что он делает сейчас, и о том, почему архитектура является одним из лучших средств коммуникации между городом, и жителями города. Спасибо большое. Представляю с радостью Патрика. One, two, three. Welcome, everybody. This will be a um, rather long lecture. I start with uh, images of well-known work, but also recent and new work. But um, then I will go into a more of a theoretical part of the lecture, and we'll talk about some of the theories and theses and positions I've been developing in the book I published in two volumes, The Autopoiesis of Architecture. It's my attempt to make sense of uh, 20 years of practice, and particularly of the last 10 years of um, a new movement in architecture which has been developing And I think it's uh, growing globally, and I want to push this movement into the mainstream to really uh, finally impact the built environment globally the way modernism had done after a year, 10 years of incubation in the 20s, and then rolled out its ideas and concepts globi globally over the following 50 years. So I think we're in a, diff a similar stage at the moment where I think there's been uh, a collective research, a great movement and research of gearing up to finally make an impact. I will talk in p about a particular aspect of that work, uh, which is important to, in many ways to understand because it touches on what I call the core competency of architecture and design, which is to do with communication and communication design. I believe uh, ultimately all design is communication design. All the totality of the built environment is an interface for communication. And also product design, fashion design, and all design discipline, including graphic design, obviously, is about uh, constructing platforms and arenas of communication. So that will be the theme, uh, which is one of the sub-themes uh, of my book. But um, just to start with a few images, I start with this project, it's a very trivial, if you say, like, if you could say program, a very mundane program, it's a park and ride uh, interchange station between a car park, a tram station coming in here, and a bus station, and a car park crossing the, uh, the road, and yet it becomes a kind of artistic intervention, it, it generates an identity, a legible space, and it communicates its function and orient, hey, orients user in this fashion. And all the elements, all the pragmatic aspects of the design are brought under a kind of unifying formalism, this kind of spatial graphics which creates this identity and makes the processes at that point clear. And so we've done, uh, of course, we've designed a lot of museums and cultural spaces which are very important, hubs, of urban communication and professional communication, but also work environments like this for BMW, or as I said, museums, like the museum here in Wolfsburg, uh, of course, the Rome Museum, which has some of the features of that new style, like all of the work I'm presenting obviously represents parametricism, that great new style after modernism I will be analyzing later, but I give you the visuals here. Uh, the Rome Museum is embedded in a kind of urban context. It creates connections with historical elements. Uh, it affiliates to urban directions and creates this kind of communication hub for the arts, 
for the design disciplines. It has a very coherent, again, formal language, both on the exterior uh, and creating urban spaces and semi-urban spaces and continues on the interior with that. There's a kind of coherency and identity of the place, a logic which articulates spaces which are all about bringing, gathering people into kind of communication scenarios and communication situations so that at the end of a visit to such a place you had a very rich experience with many uh, gathering lots of information, meeting lots of people. So I'm just clicking through some of those projects uh, most of them you might be familiar with. So this is a space which continuously moving, shifting, drifting through. There's not a, an object. It doesn't have separate uh, rooms, but the continuously evolving, changing uh, space. With every new step, new things fall into view. And there's this idea of simultaneity of presences. So you standing here inside, you can look to the urban environment, you can overlook back to the outside and through back to the inside at different places. So it's, it's suspend, it has a kind of richness, depths of vistas, complexity, and brings people into these kind of communicative constellations. So wherever you are in that building, you have multiple choices where to move next. You see people in different levels, and it's this kind of communicative scenario movement. Perhaps this building is interesting. It's a train station which uh, has different stations. We're all part of a family, so there's a clear identity, a threat, but it has a condition of an underground station, an overground station, a station on the slope, and an arrival at a plateau. All different, yet of one kind of genotype, adaptively articulated in different conditions, like an organism would uh, or a general building plan would adapt to different environmental conditions. The Opera House in Guangzhou is, is, is two volumes, so it generates a lot of interesting in-between and outdoor spaces. There's an artificial landscape which inter-articulates with the volumes, which has program embedded within it. And here again, it's a kind of creates a little coherent world with its own laws and logic to follow there's outdoor spaces, also under the plaza, in between spaces, and the connection from outdoor to indoor is very fluid, very continuous. You can have communication between inside and outside. And again, uh, you have offerings and uh, aspects to move through um, above, below, in all directions. There's a deep layered space, kind of space of simultaneity. And then you step into the auditorium, it's yet another world, but it's its own richness and complexity and uh, a new project we've done in London is a small uh, retail space and again it creates a kind of its own uh, rules, it's rule based, it's, it's complex, it's fluid, it's, it's rich, it's, it's a network of spaces uh, of different qualities and yet it's kind of an elegant navigable space. This is the villa we're doing here in Moscow. And it's also quite rich. It has a different, different parts. It integrates into a sloping landscape. These pull out so that you get a view across the canopies. Here it has a fitness area, social space. And I think a villa is basically, in the end, a space for communication, uh, to host great parties and have, uh, where, where you meet lots of people and uh, get into contact. and. It's going to be a great uh, uh, space for, for parties. And this is at the top, the more private areas where you're actually out there overlooking the, uh, the landscape. And we're currently working on the interiors. Um, the Aquatic Center in London uh, is a big kind of shell uh, integrated in the park. It's like a pavilion in the park. It has two pools, the main pool and the secondary pool. And there's a kind of an open structure. These seats will disappear later, so the landscape flows through the space, if you like. Um, the museum in Glasgow, adapting to a uh, condition of two rivers. It's a kind of simple path through the museum and integrating a ship outside into the kind of sequence of exhibits. 
a new project. Uh, we're just completing, we're opening six projects uh, this year. This is one of them uh, in Montpellier, France. It's a, it's a multi-use building with different institutions which are articulated as these solid volumes connected by these public lobby spaces. It contains an archive, a library, uh, and various often spaces for the regional government of South France. And it's a kind of sectionally conceived project where all interesting moves take place sectionally. It's again a very kind of graphic, if you like, a spatial graphic, a, a, a strong artistic language creating identity, giving certain rules which, by which you can navigate. You can know that alo along these kind of glazing areas you find all the uh, connection spaces, all the lobby spaces, and in the solids, uh, total solids, you find archive spaces, and in these windows, you find uh, the office spaces. And that is experienced both inside and outside, so the logic is also clear from the inside with these kind of sectionally interesting uh, lobby spaces, hub spaces. The uh, project, which hasn't been shown at all yet, is the cultural center in Baku. It, uh, it's a huge project, cultural center with a park. It contains a museum, a conferencing center, which spill out areas, a music hall, and a library. And here's the main entrance with one great lobby space. So it is quite fluid. It integrates with the landscape. It looks different from each side, but yet and has different offerings, different exterior spaces to spill out on, and yet you, can, you know that it's one object you're navigating. One territory keeps changing, keeps looking different, yet there's a coherency and unity. So it's uh, this unity and difference, this differentiation, which at the same time is easy to grasp, to navigate, to understand, and the way it embeds itself in uh, the landscape here. Night view. The day view, this material is also articulating the plaza. There's a continuity of material between uh, roof surfaces and plaza surfaces. This is just the rendering. We have not everything is fully finished. Uh, as you step in, again, this moment is important here, very communicative. You step in and you see activities on different levels, layered in deeps of space. You look outside the building and back onto the building. So you can imagine that at that point of simultaneity, you have lots of choices. You can grasp what's going on, not miss everything, and connect um, and make efficient use of your time to get the most of every hour of your uh, life, if you like. To kind of continuously re-network yourself. We live in a network society where we have to continuously be in touch what we should do depends on what everybody else is doing. We need to recalibrate, network, stay in touch, and therefore we need spaces where we can see what everybody else is doing so we're part of a dynamic network of continuous mutual uh, adaptation, if you like. And that's what we need these kind of spaces for, where we step in instead of disappearing into a corridor, elevator, and little cell, we step into a world where we see what's going on, what's unfolding, and can make choices. And you can see the transparency of that uh, space and the different vistas and connections it affords at any point as you move through it. So this building is the museum part, will uh, open later this year. The library part, it cascades up into the tall part, up to 80 meter. And we realized that with curvature, you can articulate, order and articulate much more complexity because you can follow continuities. You can create, you know, whether you, within the space there's con concavity versus convexity. Uh, it becomes much more complex yet legible. Where if you work with angles and, 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 and corners, the scene pollutes itself quickly, becomes visual chaos quite quickly. And here you get a lot of information uh, elegantly uh, integrated. And this is the, uh, the music hall. And again here the topic is to 
take a system instead of collaging different elements, this wall, ceiling, seating, uh, lighting, it's all modulating a single system which uh, delivers all these different functions and therefore creates something quite rich with functionality but kind of calm and clear in terms of visuality. So it's the kind of increased complexity of life articulated through a kind of reduction of complexity through visual artistic uh, languages. Similar project uh, in Beijing. Uh, totally different function, but again a cornerless space. It's a uh, retail experience, uh, shopping and also office space, working space. And here the point is, again, there's a kind of um, big space on multiple levels, uh, many choices in view. At each step you see 50 to 100 shops to choose from, to move through. There's a lot of outdoor area. And you step in and you, you can look down and up and all around and layered in depths of space you have uh, the, the life you want to participate in uh, unfolded in front of you. This is under construction in the center of Beijing. Smaller projects we're finishing in a uh, museum in Michigan. A library we're doing in um, Vienna. And here we have a kind of... We started this game of coding the space. So there are two colors, two types of volume. There's a library volume. This is the administrative central university uh, volume. And this meanders, they kind of integrate complexly, like a puzzle. And then there is this kind of glass gap, which has all the unprogrammed um, public spaces. So this becomes a kind of orienting matrix, both outside and inside. So there's a simple coding of library versus central service versus public space, which structures that complex. So this kind of, I mean by turning the built environment and the building into a system of signification, into a kind of semiotic system. And as you step in, you get again this kind of grand overview, this three-dimensional space of simultaneity that, where you can see what's going on throughout the building. And these moments happen two or three times in the building, so it's not only one, there are three such uh, connective atria, if you like. There's a second one, a secondary atrium, Again, the views outside and internal connections. So at this point, you can see what's, what's going on and make your next move, which is extremely important in contemporary network society. This is also under construction. Um, similar program, this is a research and development facility which contains office space, laboratories, contains a library, a conferencing center, and a lot of covered outdoor area. And this is in Riyadh for the energy uh, industry. It's also adapted to climatic conditions. So there's a lot of courtyards oriented north. Um, it has a lot of uh, uh, smaller perforations to, to, to the out exterior and into the courtyard, larger, larger glass areas, and a very kind of um, communicative texture of outdoor areas connecting. And this is also under construction at the moment. So it's all about uh, differentiating a field which continuously changes but has a logic and order so you can follow these vectors of transformation from the large to the small, from the intimate to the public, and um, you can kind of follow these logics and navigate uh, such a field which makes um, in the end sense because it is constructed on rules. The bridge we finished in Abu Dhabi. And here in fact as well there's a kind of uneven rhythm of arches because there's an island we had to hit and the larger opening and the smaller opening. Uh, this also implies to urbanism, so we have here a, a piece of urbanism in Singapore where we're starting with a very disparate area of collage of different zones, 
and we coming in and connecting with our texture to different conditions in a nuanced way and then create a kind of continuously differentiated field so there is a lot of difference offered but it's ordered in a way uh, that it integrates with the context and that you can follow uh, the logic of this topography and it's also under construction. Of course we also uh, doing towers. Towers is a very difficult topic in terms of network society. We need towers because we need to be get dense. Uh, but within the tower, of course, there's the question, how do we remain connective within? So we're working usually with big atria and we're trying to differentiate the tower to have interesting interfaces uh, with the ground surface, bundle towers or towers which connect with bridges. So how to create towers or open up and make wide at the ground to have more uh, con context, how to make the tower to participate in that new level of complexity. Uh, this is the kind of networking game. And we finished one tower in Marseille, which does some of that. Uh, it's very narrow, fits into a context, it opens up broader at the, at the base. It actually also connects here with the, uh, with the horizontal building. and has a series of different types of spaces inside. Uh, finally, a tower which has not been seen yet uh, for the central bank in Iraq on, on the river Tigris. It's also very communicative, it opens up. It has uh, a great kind of atrium and navigation space with panoramic elevators. All the bank walls are here, it connects to a podium. And these kind of structures are to do with the shading as well in a very hot climate. So it's not a glass tower, it's a kind of uh, environmentally adaptive tower. We're doing design as well. So what I'm talking about, this new style, is applies to urbanism, to architecture on all scales, to interiors, but also to the, the world of design, even including fashion design, furniture design, product design, the totality of the built environment and the totality of the world of artifacts is brought under the expertise of our discourse. And I think all of it needs to transform, like the time of the Bauhaus, when the Bauhaus took off, it also had ideas about urbanism, architecture, industrial design, the totality, including fashion design. So the totality of the built environment, the totality of the world of artifacts is under the spell of our discourse, of our direction, of our uh, uh, collective leadership of an avant-garde and like the Bauhaus transformed the totality of the, world of the built environment and the world of products over 50 years uh, and including this design is a uh, kind of, you know, still under the spell of Bauhaus. I think we need to change and we can make the same impact now on the basis of parametricism. So we have got engaged in furniture design, in fact, in fashion design, product design, car design, interior design. Uh, on all levels, kitchens, cars, handbags, shoes, everything is part of the, and everything is an interface of communication. We navigating the world aesthetically by the kind of environments we're stimulated by, we're drawn to. We pick out the communication partners on the base on their looks and fashion and, and, and um, so, so it's a very important interface of communication ultimately. So we're looking at this as a new table we just created. Uh, we're opening a showroom as well in London in our office and we have two offices in London so we just, it's a raw pictures, opening a showroom where we show some of our products and environments and and um, installations and set. Um, so if you come to London, pass by and have a look at our new showroom. So um, the, the headline here is what we're aiming at is what I call complex variegated order. So uh, what I believe is that architecture's task now is to organize and articulate the societal complexity of post fordist network society. Post Fordism, because before the era of modernism was Fordism, like the Ford factory, the mass reproduction of a very handful of products, endlessly repeated for decades, so that in the end the task at this point to give everybody the same standard of living, 
in terms of an industrial standard. Everybody the same house, the same car, the fridge, television, telephone, um, etc. Uh, television had only one channel as well, logically. So this was the era of modernism where you had to be efficient, you know what to produce and you just focus on dividing the work into small parcels and everybody beaver away for decades doing the same thing ever more efficiently. Now we're in a situation where we have to continuously innovate, cycles of innovation. We have electronic capacities which means that we can reprogram robots to do something different every hour, every day. So what we're doing, we let the robots work, but we need to collectively think through and design and de develop new products, new processes, new ways of, ex of, of living. And that's why we're all kind of engaged in research development. That's why we have to talk to each other all the time and, and, and plan in multidisciplinary teams what the next move are. And that's why we need to stay in touch, be networked, everybody with everybody else continuously. It's a totally different challenge for an urban matrix to, to, to order and organize this much more rich and complex network of communications. That's what architecture is uh, to be doing. And it can do that in a new way, in a more powerful way, uh, with new tools, the way we work with algorithms and, and scripted systems where we allow urban textures to self-organize according to rules, which are able to kind of adapt closely and intricately to complex environmental conditions. We can give particular constraints and criteria to these processes. And in this way, we can create something which has much more, uh, much higher levels of intelligence, something we couldn't do intuitively, we couldn't do by hand. So parametricism is that new direction. The values are complexity, intricacy, but also legibility, of course, of complex environments, differentiated environment. And I'm promoting this style, and what you saw is falling within the paradigm of this style. And I'm also written that book called The Autopersons of Architecture to look at this work in historical context, why it is important, why it is necessary, what's its superiority, and how to further upgrade uh, these capacities. What does a discipline have to learn? What intelligence does it have to inquire to do the next stage? So I'm talking about the unified hegemonic style, which, which is in the formation, and it's argued for, for by unified theory. A theory which has been developed in these through two volumes. The first volume sets the theoretical framework. I'm arguing for architecture in the context of a theory of society, which is a communication theory. I'm arguing that today, more than ever, uh, all problems we face are problems of communication and all solutions are generated through meaningful process of communication. So it's, it's, and there is a sociology which describes society as a process of communication, as a communication process, and I believe that architecture participates within that uh, and that all our products, the spaces we offer like here, they are communications. This space invites us into a particular communicative scenario, into a particular setting with particular expectations. And um, that's what it's all about. In the second volume, I'm looking at more detail how we can enhance architecture's capacity to deliver into that new network society. Uh, you can look up my website where I have um, links to the, to the book and to some of the articles and interviews which I've been uh, giving and writing for a while. So the thesis is that parametrism is a new epochal style after modernism. There have been other styles like postmodernism and deconstructivism. They were transitional styles. They were the first reaction to the crisis of modernism, the impossibility of continuing the, the way the 20th century has been operated. And this impossibility also showed up dramatically, of course, in the collapse of the Soviet Union, which was built on the Fordist paradigm of mass reproduction. And it's the most extreme form of modernism you find in the Moscow suburbs and in some of the industrial cities created in, the, in Russia, like Magnitogorsk. And this paradigm of uh, developing society could not continue. So uh, postmodernism was the first reaction, then deconstructivism, but these were temporary attempts and out of that evolved the best ideas and aspects were selected by what I now call parametricism. So the essential definition is 
that all elements of architecture has, have become parametrically malleable. That's important. And the advantage of this malleability of the elements is that they now can go into connection and association with each other. They can react to each other, adapt to each other, and therefore they create intense relations within the building complex, but also of the building complex into its context. So in the end, everything connects and communicates with everything else. So we have the ontological shift from this kind of repertoire, where architectural composition for 5,000 years was nothing but taking these primitives and just adding them up into composition, three, four, five of them. And now we're moving into a situation where we have malleable, flexible, fluid elements, splines, blobs, nerves, particles, which engage into a kind of complex interactions and generate a much more dynamic and rich and intricate spatial scenario. So when we're looking at uh, the new tools in which we're working, instead of using uh, a pencil and a ruler to create kind of dead lines, straight lines, or using a compass to create kind of same and monotonous circle lines, we're using these kind of arrays, uh, we're using dynamical systems and allow them to aggregate with, with, by the use of um, attractors and repulsing elements and giving uh, these elements different uh, properties and allow them to self-organize in these beautiful, legible, complex orders, ordered scenarios. And this is the way we're searching for designs, not by inventing or relying on the kind of uh, poverty of our imagination and drawing a few rectangles or triangles. We are letting s these systems search the solution space. And then we, some of our work comes out accordingly. So in terms of lines, and in terms of surfaces, of course, again, rather than just giving you a flat, dead, inert plate, we having a surface that is sensitive to context, sensitive to impacts. It has its own kind of differentiating will to form and it kind of is alive. It kind of it searches for form based on influences. And that's the way we develop um, the designs we, we're looking for. So and then these are the kind of surfaces, the continuously changing and modulating surfaces where a bench becomes a kind of uh, where a sofa becomes a bench, becomes a shelf, becomes uh, 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 sculpture and again these kind of surfaces where we have one surface modulating and becoming seat, becoming balcony, becoming lighting gantry, etc. And of course we do the similar thing with volumes. When we, when we do our massing diagrams we're using metaballs and blobs and, and again dynamical systems and these are the kind of projects we're generating, where volumes fuse and separate and, 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 and stay in touch and are sensitive to distortion and forces. And these are the kind of um, uh, results we're generating. So, so these are the elements. Everything becomes parametrically malleable. These are the basic building blocks of all new architecture. They're radically different from the sphere, circle, and pyramid, and adding these together. We are talking about the kind of dynamic interplay of these new, totally, uh, totally new um, um, basic building blocks. <clears throat> but we also can go further. We can give principles of how to work with these, how to search for solutions with these elements. And there is both uh, functional and formularistics, because this new style is not only about new kind of forms, uh, every new style should also have a new attitude and way of handling function, a new understanding of what the functions, the social functions, the requirements of society are and how to understand them. So we have to go through both a new set of formal principles and a new set of principles of understanding functions. I start with the formal principles. And the first important thing is that we need to really be rigorous and principled in really working with new 
principles and not falling back on old principles. So we need to be neg we have negative heuristics. We need to say what we are no longer doing. We need to exclude, for instance, these rigid forms, which uh, we should no longer work with. They are taboo. They simply lack complexity and malleability, and they need to be rejected. And I've been working for 15 years. I've never drawn a circle or a rectangle in the last 15 years. Neither has any of my students, colleagues, or friends. So this is really, in retrospect, a taboo. It's not to be done. Also what we are rejecting is what has been happening all over architecture for 5,000 years is this, this kind of repetition. And you have an element just to simply repeat a solution. Simply lack of variety is not the image of our contemporary society. I haven't done it and I will not do it for <coughs> and this is to be rejected. It's also taboo. It's important to, to have these kind of start with the negatives. And what is also important to reject, for what, we ha what has cropped up since the crisis of modernism. So modernism was all about these simple forms separating out and repeating. In s since the breakdown of modernism, what we had was this accumulation of pure difference, just the collage of unrelated elements. And Moscow City is an example of this. Just anything goes. Is it, I call that the garbage spill model of development. You can just throw anything together and just add anything whatsoever. And this creates that visual chaos, that lack of order, where you, where you cannot navigate, you cannot orient. And this kind of pure difference, which is in fact what happened in the last 30 years all over the globe, which is in fact responsible for the fact that everything looks the same. Because if you take a garbage can, all the garbage cans have different stuff in it. Right? It's all different but this difference cancels each other out. In the end, the garbage spill looks the same. It becomes this white noise of sameness. There's never identity. So if you just agglomerate pure difference, you never build up order, complexity, identity, recognizability. So that needs to be rejected. So where are we going if you're rejecting the principles of architecture of 5,000 years and we're also rejecting what spontaneously has happened since the crisis of this kind of architecture? We, there is somewhere to go, and that is we're going to kind of natural systems. These kind of images we are attracted to, these kind of intricate interplay of a water flow and a topography is a kind of lawfully generated, variegated, complex order. You find it in inorganic nature, you find it in organic nature, so it's rich, it's diversified, but it's ordered. It's, it has an internal order of pro proliferation and differentiation. And it has um, this notion again, complex variegated order. And that's what we're doing. And I think Fry Otto was the first to work in this direction. He is the first protagonist and anticipator uh, of parametricism because he used, he didn't invent form or just repeat the known forms, circles, squares, triangles, he actually was allowing material systems, natural systems to find form in a kind of complex balance of forces and co boundary conditions. And we can do this, what he did with material systems, we can now simulate in the computer to generate a kind of second nature and we can also be more free we're not restricted to what we can do with physical models, but we use the same principles and we can generate the second nature of lawfully differentiated dynamical systems which we can push out of natural parameters. We can invent systems, subsystems, and we invent, creatively invent the laws of nature and inverted commas which govern these artificial environments, but they have the same rigor and rule-based algorithmic structure like nature itself. So we become kind of inventors of second natures. And these are works of uh, students in Zaha Did Architects. This is AA, my A students, students in Vienna and students in Innsbruck. So it's a, become a global movement of developing this. So endless forms like nature. And we're doing also, we work like for auto still with material systems. When we don't rely only on software, we're first going into um, a natural system, material experimentations, and then we translate that into 
try to bring that into the world of computation and uh, develop uh, this interplay between material logics, computational logics, and the same we did in the office was using a dune formations, using it, looking at corals and branching, erosion systems, etc. This will be a great uh, inspiration um, out of nature, but also you can be totally free and artificial, of course, in inventing dynamical systems. But it needs to be rule-based, it needs to be algorithmic driven. So that is what it looks like. We know what we're no longer doing, what are the taboos, but what are the positive principles which we always adhere to. And again, in retrospect, I realized the principles I'm delivering now, I've been adhering to without spelling them out for the last 15 years. So the positive principles is all forms are no longer rigid, they have become soft. So we always start with a primitive which is inherently parametric, inherently malleable. It could take many, many forms. It searches form and looks for influences and settles temporarily. And that means when, when you work like this, you always have hundreds of variations. And it could be a, a sofa, this primitive could also morph into a, the Chanel pavilion, etc. But most important, this form, this, this, this softness is intelligent. So I can build in constraints. I can build in some uh, structural requirements, for instance, like here. These are catenary models for domes. And I can think of whole clusters of domes, networks of domes, and they are following a kind of structural logic of how they intersect and integrate and yet I still have lots of degrees of freedom to navigate and search the space, but I know that it will be structurally sound, structurally efficient. So it's very important that we can have intelligently soft forms. We choose which parameters to fix and set as constraints and which parameters to, to, to handle intuitively to search the remaining uh, space, solution space, if you like. And then we can degenerate such. The second principle is if we have these parametrically soft elements and we generate systems with multiple and many of these components, we need to make sure that we're not ending up with a kind of simple repetition. So instead we always differentiate. So we're always thinking of fields of differentiation. They're not, they don't stay the same. They kind of uh, follow a kind of gradient logic of transformation and differentiation. And that's very important. And again, this differentiation uh, can be made intelligent. For instance, it can follow environmental adaptiveness logic. So it's a kind of shading element, and as the sh shape changes direction against the sun exposure, the element kind of adapts to that. And what is good about it, it makes the, ele the element adaptive, it's technically efficient, but also when you move along the surface, you can orient. You know, even on an overcast day, where south, north, east, west and you, can, you, you have a kind of, you know in which direction you're moving. So it's also oriented and it's also communicating. Whenever you use rules, you allow participants to make inferences back and uh, navigate. So, so we do that with a number of projects. Uh, you take directly engineering inputs, whether it's structural engineering input or here uh, climatic uh, information, and you can directly your cre creativity lies in how you transcode the data map into an architectural adaptation. And there are, of course, hundreds of different ways you could do that. But in each way, you find, in the end, a nuanced adaptation where you have an optimal uh, shading effect at each point, And you can also orient um, uh, along such a surface. And the same applies to urbanism. So instead of dropping the same block across the field, an urban field, you can let a kind of field of urban typologies differentiate and morph, maybe in response to topography, maybe in response to other elements in the environment, and you generate something much more elegant and also much more differentiated in terms of uses. And then you, clients have lots of different things to choose from, and then you can observe the market and reinforce and change your model to follow also market demand, if you like. Um, the, the most important principle is once you have these differentiated systems is that we need to 
correlate within. So the correlation or is the kind of associative logic of the parametric model where the different subsystems now respond to each other, recognize each other, are uh, uh, adapting to each other, resonate with each other, so that one system uh, uh, interlock, interacts with another, and, and in the end, um, the different systems become, in a sense, representations of each other. So the first system here is the system of folds and pleats, which delivers the space, the balconies, etc. The second system is that swarm of lights, and this swarm of lights has a rule of how it flies into that surface and settles according to rules. And therefore, it becomes a kind of representation of these folds. There's an interaction association between two subsystems. It's a bit, it's like a flock of birds flying onto a tree. And every action has a reaction. So when a tower hits the ground, it's not just stops dead. It, you can, I'm inviting you, or the dogma here is you have to invent a reaction. There needs to be an impact, a repercussion, an association, a kind of correlation. So where the tower hits, maybe it generates a kind of crater of ripple effect, which become a kind of inverted podium where you can have the retail, etc. now in, its in, in that crater. Or here, a tower which is a multi-use tower, it changes from a square plan to a T-shaped plan to an H-shaped plan. It changes from correlated with retail, office space, and residential space. And then the facade pattern also associates and modulates. It's a kind of rule of association where it changes from a closed facade to a curtain wall facade to a kind of balcony facade. So the system has the capacity to correlate and respond and modulate relative to function, relative to tower shape. And of course you can in the parametric model, you can associate the various subsystems and components so that they change together, but in effect in non-linear ways, in non-trivial ways. And here's an example of a tower where I say, you take, for instance, the different subsystems of the tower, the skeleton, the structural subsystem, it is not just the same all the way through the tower. That's the way the modernists did it. But it's irrational because the, the, the forces accumulate. The bottom has much more vertical forces. The moment forces accumulate at the ground. So there's stability and stress moments are much, much higher at the bottom and much less at the top. So I think you need to differentiate the skeleton along the vertical axis. You can also assume that the tower is communicating with other towers so it leans over. And then you get this kind of structural force diagram as an input into the design process. And first of all, we're saying instead of having this system of ev always the same, the smaller tower with the core in the middle, then outrigger, then tube system, that's irrational. This is better where the, where the, where the, where the, where the skeleton differentiates. It starts at the tube at the bottom, then becomes a kind of stable core later on. But what is important here, to go back to the example, you can take engineering input, this time it's structural engineering input, and you just invent, your creative work is now to invent a transcoding, a script, which takes this structural information and translates it into a kind of structural architectural network diagram. And that is your creative act, how to transcode. It needs to be structural sensible, but there are hundred ways of doing this. And here it's a way of, uh, of intensifying the network capacity of the structure. The next you come in with differentiating uh, open, open areas from more closed areas. And you can again create a kind of transcoding script which delivers a rule. So you don't have to invent it point by point. You just think what is a sensible rule of translating a tower form into the distribution of open and closed. Then you come in with the, with the floor plates and again there's a rule by which the floors relative to curvature pull away to create internal atriums. And then you think of the core and the ribs and the rib structure. There's a simple rule of projecting equidistant points into the to a kind of eccentric core and then the ribs are differently dense 
the more dense they are, the more far away, the more deeper is the slab, the more deeper is the rib. And you can therefore generate information. If you move along here, you know ribs are dense, ribs are deep. I'm in a deep space, even if you can't always see it otherwise. So everything, if you work in this rule-based correlative way, everything has information about something else. Uh, because it follows a law, a logic, you can make inferences. And uh, also what you get is something which looks awesomely beautiful because it is kind of intricately built according to quasi-laws of nature, if you like, your invention, of course, but it creates a beauty which, is, has, uh, which you feel attracted to, you think you can trust, it is intricate, you're curious about its principle, its laws, and that's what attracts us because there's, there's some kind of uh, intelligence, a high level of intelligence inbuilt in the structure. And that, I think that's what we perceive when we love it, when we feel beautiful. If you look at a garbage spill, a garbage where there's no intelligence, no information, no correlation, you, you're not interested. You find it ugly, you can throw something at it, you add and take away without making any difference. But here, to add and take away, you cannot arbitrarily add something or take something away. You have to add according to the rule. And if you add a whole new layer, you have to invent a rule system which settles this new layer onto that. For instance, the, um, the facade. It, it, it traces the atriums with lightness of uh, perforation, for instance. And when you, in the end, look at it, there's a totality of correlated subsystems which it's non-arbitrary. The more you work, the more difficult it becomes to add something. In the normal way, the collage way, you just add something, it's easy. Next step is always as easy as the first step. Here, the later steps become ever more difficult because there's ever more intricate, intelligent order to destroy. And you can only enhance, but you can always enhance if you follow the principles. If you follow the principle of giving your elements more parametric freedom, of differentiating your subsystem and then correlating, most importantly, these subsystems to what you have. So with these projects you can make ever more beautiful, intricate, intelligent if you work along these principles. But if you, if you step away from these principles, you will destroy this project. So here are the principles. Negative, no rigid forms, no simple repetition, no collage of isolated, unrelated elements. Positive, all forms are soft. They are intelligent, therefore every deformation is in fact an information. It gives you information. All systems are differentiated, all systems are correlated. We're talking multi-system setups, of course. So and the advantage of this is this intensity of relations, where everything you see tells you about other things happening. It tells you where in this transformational system you are, whether you're at the bottom, middle, or top of the tower. It, the facade if you look at the facade, it tells you how deep the space is at that point, etc. So everything is connected to everything else according to rules. That means you have information retrieval at any point, even about things which are not visible. If you look at this kind of shading element, you know which direction of the sky you're you, you related to, etc. So this is the essential innovation, the internal integration of the different systems, but also external adaptation is possible. So if you look at an urbanism here, Instead of this everything the same, where the modernism would have a, th you have two existing contexts and you add a third, here we are able to adapt nuanced way to the existing. At the same time, we create radically different conditions. This open clearing, this dense towers, small to large, there's radical difference, yet there's continuity and lawful differentiation. So it's easy to navigate. You can, you can navigate the and easily find and drawn to this point or to that point. So I'll play it again. So I mean, this is the power of this, of parametricism, something which is possible. You can take, you can give me any rugged and disparate collage of contextual elements and I can come in and integrate them into a coherent, elegant, differentiated Text, new texture, which is a lot of new qualities, but incorporates the old qualities and gives them a place in a global order. So we're moving from, uh, and this is still a kind of single system setup, just the fabric, uh, the massing, but of course we're moving from simple massing, and this is another algorithm where you can pick up streets and, 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 and create a kind of complex massing. 
but I'm interested also in, in multiple systems integrating towers with landscapes, with low-level buildings. Uh, and here is a, is a system, for instance, where we used fluids. We were using different color fluids to generate an urban pattern. And then we're transcoding this information data set into different three-dimensional sets of information. But this is just a single system. All fluids are translated in one way. Here you can see that you can translate different fluids in different ways. So you have suddenly two systems, but they still interact like f two fluids. So there's a kind of coherency and law and order in this, m this richer environment. And now there's a kind of third system. So all these systems here, in a sense, are invented, created transcodings of these fluids. The overall fluid dynamic is still in the system. And this towers rise because the fluid was more dense and less dense here, etc. And we're doing it again here in another project. Uh, this was, in fact, a, a Moscow city. And we're starting with a, a, a kind of field of, of particles or, or massing particles. And then we use that with a second system of uh, distributing color and distributing these kind of network lines. So you can have a different, each density delivers a different shape and a different pattern of networking. And in the end, a, trans a few translations down, it gets this kind of image. So it's a very rich texture. There's a lot of difference, a lot of uh, diversity. But they're all kind of uh, following laws and logics, a bit more complex. You need to live there for a while to learn and, and understand these logics. But they are as logical as a natural environment. And the indigenous people in, comp in, the, in the jungle, they know how to read the environment. They can see where there's dry, where's the river. They can find the river just by watching how the vegetation transforms. And this is the same thing here. You can, you can find things by, by seeing how it's the impact of the thing you're looking for ripples through the system. But this is all the formal principles. Now, functionally, it's also important that the new style has a totally new attitude towards function. Uh, we are no longer thinking of function as a simple schedule of accommodation with a handful of flick stereotypes, residential, commercial, as if there was only one type of residential and if it was to be always separate. So these stereotypes, office space is a meaningless concept. You need to understand the particulars of an organization, of a life process, the, you know, if it's large, small, medium size, mixed and unmixed. So these, fa these stereotypes are out. We're no longer assuming this social homogenization like modernism, uh, which has to do with these stereotypes. And we're no longer working with this kind of segregative zoning, where you kind of put residential here, retail here, and workspaces there, and separate everything out. That's all these kind of things we're, we're negating. We want to have the kind of intricacy of differentiation. So instead, positively, we're saying all functions are parametric. They're not stereotypes. They all have variables and they're variant. So we're talking about variable event scenarios. We're saying all program domains are differentiated and potentially mixed. And we're saying everything communicates with everything else instead of everything is separate. So it's important that, this, that the style has this kind of both a functional and a formal heuristic. So these are the functional principles in summary. Again, taboos and dogmas. Never think of in terms of stereotypes. Never think in terms of secular zoning. Never assume social homogenization, etc. Always think of parameters or variables of your programs. Always think of an event. You challenge you. How do you can differentiate the, pro the program you're thinking about? And how do you can think of having everything communicate with everything else? And it's always a challenge. What else can I make the space communicate with? What else can I take into account? Maybe something which is quite far away. How can that impact? And, and it's on this side of the site, even if it's a two kilometers away, there's a kind of city center, it still should kind of asymmetrize, radiate and ripple through my texture. It's an infinite project. I can always in, in, uh, have more things to correlate to. So that's a kind of heuristics which the more I work, the longer I think it through, the more intense, the more beautiful, the more uh, uh, and enhanced the project becomes. So these heuristics are ways of self-criticism, I'm still too rigid, I'm still too stereotypical, I'm still working with repetition, and they're invitations to continuously upgrade your project. That's why they're kind of principles of, let's say, 
progressing a project. And I use that as well. And I can criticize all the works I'm showing with these principles and show what, where I haven't gone far enough, uh, what, what the next step should be. So parametrism is a new epochal style after modernism. It's a new universe of possibilities, and it's radically different from what everything else existed in terms of repertoire, but the purpose is still to organize and articulate life. And the two books I've published go through that, uh, and I'm now, I, I hinted at it earlier, so it's a comprehensive theory which is basing architecture on communication theory. It starts with a discourse analysis of the discipline, so I'm looking at how over the centuries the discipline has evolved key categories, the distinction between form and function, the category Various of aesthetic values, etc., uh, certain methodologies, and how they have been upgraded, how they have evolved historically, and how they should be upgraded in the next stage. That's very inform important here. First, explain, and there's a lot of respect for the discipline. I'm not saying everything which happened uh, was kind of horrendous and needs to be stopped. I have a lot of respect for the evolution of 500 years of architectural intelligence and each stage brought progress as you move from the Renaissance to the Baroque. There's progress into historicism, into modernism, but yet there's a next stage. And what is the next stage? How to upgrade the discipline? And the theory has the attempt to integrate various partial theories might, might, one might have. For instance, most importantly, you need to understand architectures unique societal function to understand the core competency of architecture. How it is to be demarcated, for instance, against engineering. What is different from, between architecture and design and engineering? And I think there's a big difference. Engineering is dealing with the kind of technicalities of an environment and architecture deals with its kind of communicative capacity. Uh, it's also quite different from art. In, in, in design, I mean, it seems to be similar to an art and still confused with art. Architecture is also confused with engineering. It's very important to be clear why, what is so different about, against engineering, what is so different against art. Art never is instrumentalized. Art rema always remains this free play, this uh, uh, never taking a stance, never kind of implementing and taking responsibility. There's a theory of the design medium because it's very important, as you can see, the totally new tools and media of design. We need to understand the importance of the medium with respect to the universe of possibility it opens. There's a theory of the design process. There's a theory of aesthetic theory. Aesthetic values, they are shifting, they are evolving. They're different now than they have been. And the importance of aesthetic values. We are living by aesthetic sensibilities. We don't have time each time when we step into, a, into an urban texture to analyze the pros and cons of a particular uh, uh, performance. Of, we just navigate by intuitive aesthetic value. That's why we pick out our communication partners, where we pick out the environment. So it's very important. But it's important that we historically upgrade, that we, for instance, collectively learn this kind of lust for complexity, that we are love vital and complex environment, that we are, we are not kind of scared by it, that we love change and the dynamism of life, for instance, and that we therefore also love these dynamic complex environments. Because if you don't like them, you pull away, you can't participate, you will be unproductive, unhappy, and the kind of sour grapes person. So it's important to understand that we aesthetic values are what we always navigate and, and, and act upon. But at a certain point, we need to step back and reflect and critique them, select them, and then kind of rely on them once more. And that's what these kind of principles are doing. And there's a few more, and the important thing also the theory of style, because I believe the concept of style is important. These are the great epochal paradigms of architecture. They make sense. As you shift from Gothic to Renaissance to Baroque to historicism to modernism, we always, we're, we're tracking, architecture is tracking the great epochal shifts in societal conditions. So we're moving from the medieval feudalism to, this, in, to the Renaissance, we're moving to the kind of early capitalist, city-states of Florence, and there's a kind of new level of freedom where religion is replaced by science, etc. So there's a kind of uh, res reflected in a new, actually the, the emergence of architecture as a theory-led creative discipline for the first time. And then we move from there to the Baroque. The Baroque has a capacity to, to, to articulate and order much larger complexes. The Renaissance is still additive. Each element has internally symmetry, but it, it's additively composed. The Baroque has these huge sweeps of convex, concave, 
of asymmetric parts integrating into huge global entities. Uh, the Baroque city, the Versailles, these are much larger complexes. And the Baroque has the capacity with this plasticity and, and, and this deep relief to, and, and, and curvature to draw much more larger complexes together. So the Baroque is superior to the Renaissance. And again, we can go through historicism, modernism. In each new era, there's a new style. And as modernism collapsed, we still haven't found, well, I think there is in the avant-garde, a new style which can claim that, take that stage. Uh, but uh, it's yet to happen. And, and invite all of you, of course, to participate in this. Uh, what is important here is that architecture, what it really does is it frames communication. It allows uh, all of us in this complexity of communicative situations and institutions which society consists of, thousands of different types of events, of types of communication, of types of characters and lifestyles and, and, and work relations need to be ordered. And they ordered through the environment. If you imagine a city like Moscow, with all the things you have to do on a daily level and all the people, the institutions and places you have to find to do your things you need to do. If you imagine there's no city which tells you where everything is and you have a huge kind of empty tarmac surface and everybody is stripped naked so you have no information. Nobody knows what to do, where they are, who they are. Nothing can take place. So what the environment is does, not trivially keep the rain out, that's also engineering stuff, but the point is it orders us, it sorts all of us and all the events so that we navigate the city like a matrix where we can find appropriate and relevant communication partners in situations which are specific. There's a difference between a bar and entertainment and a nightclub versus a conference setting, a meeting, a lecture, all these different events, the types of events, types of situations which we need to go through. Uh, we, this is what the urban matrix and the architecture does as an ordering system, as a language, as a semiotic system ultimately, a system of signification which brings us together and puts us into the right mood, into the right constellations like this kind of lecture is which is different from a seminar, is different from a workshop and each time we need settings specific and that's what architecture delivers. So social order requires a spatial order. Architecture provides in fact the long-term social memory as a necessary subset of evolution. So I'm saying not only now we need the city fabric Always already, all societies needed the built environment, the complexity of it as a social memory, as it actually only through evolving this built environment was society evolving. Without a built environment, you would still be kind of flock of apes roaming around, no progress, no cultural progress, because no DNA equivalent and we have an evolutionary process of organism because there's a DNA, a material substrate which accumulates information and reproduces this information through trial and error and includes new information and that's reproduced. And this kind of material substrate which is accumulating through trial and error information and then is stable, cross-generationally stable, can accrue and build up. That's the city. The city is in fact the the physical DNA of cultural evolution. And without a city, no society. So this is the way through this kind of device, and this now can build over decades and centuries and become richer and more complex, we can actually become a social organism, if you like, more complex than a flock of apes, which every new generation they have to relearn their, their, their kind of have no, no substrate, no cumulative buildup of order. And this orders society, it orders a particular sub set of a larger group, it orders us in different status groups, it orders different activities, so you remember what to do, when to do, there are rituals which cling to this, there is religious, and this is what, what happens, I mean this is like an information processing substrate, a kind of cumulative text which, which tells you who is who, who's, who has which responsibility, who can marry who, who can at what age cross a certain threshold and what to do uh, in a kind of ritualized, and that is a stable, that can reproduce and now accumulate complexity. And you will also not find any society without this, without enhancing the social order through making social demarcation distinctions, 
like we, the difference between fe male and female, we are still radically coding that. So it's in, in a split second. If we wouldn't have makeup and fashion, we might not even know who is male, who is female. But more importantly, of course, we are encoding a whole social universe in the fashion system, and we're still relying on that. You can see the difference between a student and, and, and a banker. They might both of them be 27 years old, but you immediately know uh, who to pick and who not to pick if you, in terms of criteria of relevancy. So that has always been the case, and that's now the domain of design. That's why I'm including design, fashion design, products, architecture. And also these kind of morphological, this kind of iconographic enhancements which we do to ourselves, we also do to our buildings. It's not only the natural morphology they have, which we recognize, but we are kind of ornating and, make, and, 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 and ingraining, making speak these architectures. And this idea that architecture should speak was, of course, uh, what was the demand of postmodernism? When society became more complex, lifestyles differentiated, this monotony of the forest city, which was perfectly correct for a society where everybody had the same life, getting up at nine, going to the factory, getting the same, doing more or less the same, uh, in that big kind of di division of labor, that was perfectly fine. The, the, the image of the modernist city is the image of the modernist for the society, and there was a universal consumption center. But now we're talking about architecture needs to start speak again much more complexly, and then we're moving from postmodernism, in fact, to something like deconstructivism. Postmodernism did it by borrowing old iconography, and deconstructivism started to say, "Hey, we meet, we can kind of differentiate this way, but we can invent our own abstract new iconography, and be more principled and systematic with that." And instead of separated zoning, we kind of integrate and layer and, 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 and create kind of multiple superimposed uh, systems and create this kind of, this, the lust for complexity was there already in deconstructivism. But it, made, it was kind of chaotic and uh, in a self generating in the end that garbage spill, which is still better than the monotony. I rather have the kind of Tokyo or, or collage garbage spill development than the kind of endless monotony of, of uh, Moscow suburbs. But we took this idea of layered, of com building up complexity, but now in a kind of ordered way. Their gradients, their laws of association, a squeeze which encompasses everything. And this was early 90s, where we started at Columbia University. It was still too chaotic, we, we, it's not, not very refined, it was primitive computationally. But then we worked through the 90s on this, and um, develop this style we're now mature and confident about and now understand more its purpose, its power, its superiority and that's why I think we are, we, are, we are more than ready to roll it out into the real world and you saw our projects which we're doing in, in different uh, continents and different function domains we're going now all over the world all function domains we're addressing, we're working on all scales and we've grown from a company of five when I started to a company of 400. But it's still a drop in the ocean, so inviting you to participate. So this is some of the things we did in the mid-90s, competitions we all lost, but since the last 10 years we've actually been more successful. So, so the societal function to repeat is the innovative ordering and framing of communicative interaction on a new level of intensity, density, intricacy, uh, etc. And the way I'm thinking about it, architectural order, we need to organize, we need to sort people in space, distancing them out, bringing together, separating, connecting. That's the physical, just the physical bodies. How are they kind of distributed? That's the question of organization. The second question is, how do we kind of uh, turn this into something perceptually palpable? It's not only physically separate, ordering and sorting and, and connecting, but making that on a new level of complexity, the problem becomes, can I see this? Can I navigate this? Because it's not the object order which is important only, but the subjective legibility and comprehensibility of that order, because I rely on people to navigate this actively. So it's the question of articulating that order, not, and, and articulating this for the sake of phenomenology, so perceptual palpability, conspicuity, that I can perceptually break down the scene, and as a system of uh, science, a semiotic language. So the parametric organization, 
That's where we have to upgrade. What is complex organization? We know very little about it as architects. Uh, we know maybe grids, and that's more or less it. We have no much else ordering devices, maybe an axis, maybe kind of symmetry. No, we need to go into a research of enhancing organizational patterns, organizational capacities, network logics. There's a whole mathematics we can, we can work on. There's kind of, these points can be connected in all sorts of ways and they make a big difference, both in terms of detour factors and quantitative efficiency, but also in terms of the political order of such a space. This one has a center. This one does have a kind of uh, absent center, and this one has a kind of grid where everything connects to everything else. So they make a lot of difference in terms of hierarchizing the space. This one has centers and subcenters, so it creates positions, and these positions will create social identities. So in a sense, the spatial order will, in a sense, force and differentiate identities. There will be a struggle for this position, a struggle for this position, and, and it will give structure to the space. It's nearly inevitable. So it's, we need to know about these things. We need to distinguish them. We need to understand them both qualitatively and quantitatively. And there's been research like this uh, uh, also in terms of efficiency, the system's uh, total network length versus total detour imposed. But I'm more interested in the political and social ordering capacity of these systems. And the same is with arrays of cells. Um, these are the different kind of networks configurations you can, you can embed in, in, this, in this plan diagram, which is more telling than the, than the plan shape. Now, if you look at this, this looks the same, but through different openings and closings, you have totally different, you have kind of r rings versus a kind of branching system versus a kind of deep space. These are also an intelligence we need to acquire. Or well, here, this, these, are, these are different ways. This space looks like this from the position 19. From the position 15, it's quite different. You can go in three directions first. One, two. So that, that we have to look at the, the organization we're working on. We have to first grasp the potential. We also need to know that it's position specific, what the organization is. And we can start to work with kind of flows and connection and multiple and changing connections. So that's the world of geometry, uh, the world of organization. The next point is kind of, and that's parametric organization. Phenology, we're working with kind of um, how you perceive things. You see vertical lines here and you see horizontal lines here because there's proximity. You see similarity also draws these things together. So there's different ways to break down a scene. You see kind of circular territory, although they're objectively and physically not there. It's just the way our perceptual habits allow us to uh, order this kind of chaos of points into a kind of structure. So we need to understand how we break down scenes. We usually follow curvature along. So this one we see as two lines crossing. We could have seen it as two or two like this, pointing, meeting, but we don't. So there's a privileging of the continuous line, for instance. Or this one we, we privilege convexity. So this results like this are not two Ks or two an M and a W. It could be. So you can also play with this. This is an ambiguous figure. It could be two Ks. It could be an M and a W. Or it's that. So we can play with it. We reckon with that. Nothing is objectively there in the built environment. This bottle is trivial. I know it's one object because I can move it against the background. But in this ensemble of buildings, it's very unclear how I should decompose the scene into objects. Am I seeing this hollow space as an object? Am I seeing this as one object versus a second object? So the decomposition in entities, what are the unities of interaction? What are the units? What is the composition I perceive? It's always an act of perception. It's always an act of comprehension. And that we need to grasp. And that gives also a power of having one objective setting, giving it a several potential mental decompositions and readings. So everything has to be considered. So we're looking at figure ground reversals and we're looking at the empty space, we're looking at the full space as a figure. We know that we're using symmetry and that we have the, that the symmetry becomes most powerful when, the, when it is, we start with an amorphous. If I have a symmetry between one simple symmetry and put the next one to it, it's not very powerful a symmetry. But the more amorphous, the more powerful the symmetry in terms of an object. 
we can see figures in an open texture. So what is that? It's just abstract stuff. If I tell you that there's a woman with a guitar, you might be able to start seeing something. If I give you this, and then you look across, again, you start to see a woman on a guitar. So this is this act of perception which depends on the way we break down an always ambiguous, in a sense, perceptual world into figures and foreground and background and where we let by prior conceptions. So I can also take this into account. I can prime you into this space from bringing to another, you come from one side into the space, you see something, you come from another side, you see something else. So different audiences can be given different, ob different uh, settings, even though objectively there's only one thing there. So you have all these context effects. These lines are in fact the same, these lines are straight, um, these lines are still straight, these, the color of these dots is exactly the same as you can, as I'm proving here. So there's lots of these, these are the same again. And there are these kind of context effects. And this is the kind of image where I'm saying this is what the contemporary architecture should be like. It should be a kind of field of stuff which has multiple ways of resolving itself into a reading into a composition. So here you might see a guitar on the table, it's still life, a Corbusier is still life. But in reality, if you look at it again, you might say maybe there is no car. The, car, the guitar falls apart because the whole of the guitar is just a top plate on a pile of plate. This is just another shape like an armchair pushed against the table. These kind of tensioning devices are just the tops of the bottle or pipes. Then you see here the book, parts of the book together with the glass creates a second bottle. So these are the kind of games, perceptual games, if you like, we always, in fact, are at play and we should upgrade our architectural intelligence to play with this consciously and work with this consciously simply with the fact because there is no objective constitution of the built environment. It is always a reading it is, and we can guide that reading, we can work with that reading. And there are always multiple readings depending on observer position, on observer uh, history as well, and how much we are socialized into environment. So this is a kind of sculpture by Michael Heitzer. You can see a kind of f set of fragments which resolves itself into a clear figure from a particular view and then dissolves again. And we've done that with a number of projects. This is a kind of uh, cluster of tower, and this is the same cluster looked at from different sides. And you can now see the same transformation happening this is one objective happening which has four different perceptual registrations. So here you on, the, on, on, on this side you have opening up to the top, here you have opening up to the bottom and here you have something in between. So these are images of the same model in top view looks actually quite chaotic. So this is the way we work with this. Are we looking at this? Uh, an objective geometry seemingly a square grid. As the camera moves, it changes into a circle packing. So it is objectively seeming, well, it's a certain shape, but it appears as a grid at one stage, as a circle packing at another stage, only by moving your perspective, your view. And here's the reverse. You have an actually, seem, the top view gives you a circle packing, and in perspective shift, it at some points looks just like a grid. And then looks like an intensified wave. So you can have one object giving different character, identity to different perspectives, then it associates potentially with different things. So you can kind of, kind of continuously replay, reorder the elements of the, the composition and therefore you can reorder our communicative behavior, our, what we're looking for, how we gather. And this is another one where, we, where we're just taking observer, the parametrics of object parameter, ambient parameter, light and shadow, and observer parameter, shifting. This is only shifting, obviously, camera position again. It just swivels. It's one object, st static, stable object, nothing changes in terms of the shapes, but they seem to be 
uh, creating waves and individual blobs and then waves again. So that is what I do under the heading of parametric phenomenology. So we have parametric organization, we have parametric phenomenology and we have parametric semiology, which is most important, the kind of creating the built environment as a semiotic system, uh, making systematic correlations between form and function and in a no, very nuanced way. And that creates the design project has for me these three layers. I start with a general party with some kind of sense of organizing pattern, but we have to remember that it's, it's going to be in the end relative to phenomenological resolution. And it's also in the end, uh, most importantly, a semiological project because we are not only perceiving, we are reading these things as signs. So, uh, and signs have the kind of domain of the signifier, which is just this physical stuff, and the signified the meaning this physical stuff points us towards. So in terms of architectural terms, you see a kind of surface and you realize this is the plaza, I can, I'm allowed to go here, I might expect certain people here, I can behave in a certain way, that's the meaning of that surface, is in fact our behavior relative to it ultimately. It's, 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 uh, it's function, it's use. So and the meaning of a word is also its use, as Wittgenstein uh, told us. Uh, the, the, the meaning of a certain word, uh, hello, is its function, its use, what I'm doing with this work. Uh, and the space, the meaning of a space is its use, form signified function, and how does it do it? How does a certain space, a certain signifier uh, generates and, and, and uh, acquires a meaning through distinctions, never by itself. It's always a system of distinctions a system of differences which in the domain of the signifier and the domain of forms, formal differences in the end are correlated and coded in terms of functional or behavioral differences. That in the end is what it's all about and there's a kind of um, these two worlds, the world of form and the world of function, they confront each other and they're kind of the differences in the one domain, they, 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 they kind of uh, interact and in a sense lock into the differences of the other domain and only then we, we actually we get determinate identities. And each language sets up different differences and cuts up the world in different ways and that makes also that these different languages might not be translatable into each other because in the end it's not meaning to meaning or w one word with one meaning but a system of words builds up a system of distinction which is then mapped onto a system of social distinctions, if you like. Um, and you can look at now the visual languages, and it's very primitive, a uh, kind of traffic sign system. And we can create spatial languages, a kind of coding of um, different relationships on a very abstract level. Something which is more close, less close, le uh, slightly open, totally open, a public space, more social space, a personal space, an intimate space, and we can do that with this kind of gradient, and then we, we can maybe now, with this kind of thing in mind, we generate fields, and we're trying to kind of read these fields with this coding in mind, and if we now program accordingly, in the end, if you navigate the space, you will, you might, you kind of learn, like you learn a language, through experience the correlation, not by learning a kind of vocabulary we can kind of uh, try to make the built environment very systematically with a grammar, with a vocabulary, with a, uh, uh, b building it as up as a kind of language. And you learn the language by encountering its in its use, systematically. You don't need to kind of go away and learn this, you learn it kind of through habit, habitually entering and working and moving through the space. And the, and the unit which is significant in, in, the, in the architectural language is always a territory. Like in verbal language, it's the sentence, not the word. A word by itself has no meaning. If I say dog, you don't know what I'm, I'm not telling you anything. I don't know what I'm talking about, why am I saying it, what am I saying. I'm saying nothing basically. If I say sky, what? But if I tell you, you know, uh, take the dog out, then you know what what I'm saying, you're doing something. The same is with architectural language, it's actually a territory, a single column is, has no meaning, for instance. 
um, um, uh, just a kind of tall mark. I mean, materiality has no meaning. It's always when materiality, certain morphologies construct the territory, a space, and it doesn't need to be an enclosed space, just the territory, then that acquires a meaning because as I enter or exit the space, that makes a difference with respect to what I'm expecting. If I'm crossing a threshold into a territory, I might have to adapt my behavior if I'm moving from outside to inside, from the public street into the courtyard. It's, this is the communication. It now changes everybody's behavior and therefore makes a new institution, a new situation possible, and it orders people in, in, in new ways. So that's why a kind of the language of architecture and has the kind of territory as a minimal significant unit. And it is, can either be accepted or rejected. You either enter or exit. You accept or reject my command, take out the dog. Every communication has kind of that capacity to be accepted or rejected. And we worked, for instance, with um, a, a student project where we tried this systematically. We're creating the first of a kind of uh, some organizational diagrams using color coding and certain labels. And in the end, these color codes and the labels are replaced by morphological distinctions positional distinctions, uh, text, material texture distinctions, etc. So in the end, all what I need here to know what I'm doing is being replaced by design itself. And the information is preserved and even enhanced. So it becomes a very information rich. So the difference between a faceted shell versus the creased shell versus the smooth shell is the difference between, for instance, the School of Science, the School of Arts, the School of Humanities in a university. They're different shapes, which mean lecture, library, workshop, seminar. And they can now be combined. So there's now the, the lecture and the art school, the lecture and the science, the lecture and the engineering department. So these two are kind of overlapped and combined. And, and so we build up a kind of uh, repertoire. And again, you work parametrically in different scales, different sizes. And then you look at structural system, for instance. And Yes, we need to structure, it's a technical issue. When I'm saying use it also as an articulation issue, use it as a coding issue. If the structure in a space gives the space character, identity, a large space has large beams, the direction of the beams gives you a sense in which direction is the space longer. Uh, if it's a, a contemporary engineering, a kind of a deep beam in the center means this is the center of the space. So if you have an intricate adaptive engineering, it tells you a lot about the shape of the space. You could also use it as characterizing a space. This is a large space, a public space. I'm saying our task in this is to use engineering intelligence and turn engineering forms into an articulation medium and characterize and articulate space and bring that into a systematic system of signification and build a language which is the same with, the, with all the environmental engineering aspects, with brisoles, with shading elements, with openings, with framings, with joint lines, with tessellations, all these things, we, we, they become a medium of articulation, part of a semiotic code. That's the way we're kind of working. So with each of these decisions, you now not, you have always many possibilities technically. And we know it's going to be parametrically differentiated because also the functions we want to parametrically differentiate. And our task now is to, you, to, to make this stuff speak that everything I encounter gives me information, tells me something. So I can work in this way that I'm having always an excess of, mat of formal material and I think of interpreting it. And interpreting it means using it systematically. That all the entrances now have a particular way of framing so I can recognize the entrance. Etc. So here you can say that every different type of ribbing has a different functionality encoding or different social encoding. I'm also saying it's not only different types of interactions to be distinguished, it's different social types. Is this a student? Is it a member of staff? Is it domain for visitors, for the general public? So different social types need to be distinguished as well. And this is a kind of, uh, I can't go into detail with this, and uh, the morphologies are drawn from these kind of uh, simulations, the morphology is very rich and diverse and now turn it into a kind of grammar, into a kind of semiotic system. And in the end I have, uh, you know, strong identities, different articulations which have different meaning, 
interacting with different ground reliefs. And just give you a glimpse of this, the way this might um, look. In the end, you have something which has a complexity, a richness, an orderedness, a correlative intensity. But when you now think of the life processes which move through it, you can find how this codes social type, how this codes function type, how this codes interaction scenarios, and everything makes sense and guides you and, 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 and has meaning. Of course, that is a kind of um, very demanding project, and there might still be excessive uninterpreted elements which are now interpreted through appropriation and uh, new rules of use uh, uh, use that texture and invent, of course, audience participation in a sense in that final encoding is required. And we can just speculate in the end, the, 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 the actual life process is, is, will speak that language, will morph that language, will change that language. So this is the way we're looking at uh, the world of spatial signage. And again, it's intricate, it's interesting. You can, on the one hand, uh, it's, and, and again, it's subjective in many ways. What is one sign, signifier even, versus another? You need to rely on the kind of socialized reader. The, the, these look very, very similar, but they're all different. They're clearly discrete. These are letters of the alphabet. They look very similar, but mean something radically different. This one, they look all radically different, but they're all the same. They're the letter A. So you have a huge scope to use the distinction between A, B, and C, and the, you can use the, all of these in the end could be the A. So you have an enormous richness of using and reusing distinctions, and there seems there's nearly no limit on the final uh, phenomenology of that. So this is to be considered. So just to, to go through this, um, these are the kind of, to make this work, the architectural semiotic system should not speak about the world, politics, and symbolize uh, things outside the institution. The building should speak only about itself and what takes place within it and the kind of the, the communication it facilitates. So the question is really to constrain the domain of the signified to then be really effective. So what would the user like to know about the territory? What can the territory communicate about itself? That's the question. So first of all, what will or can happen here? That is a function type. Whose space it is? Who is welcome here? Who might I expect here? It's a social type. But also, where am I here? Where can I go from here? So you also encode within the space what to expect beyond its ambit. So there's also this um, aspect. So there is the kind of denotation, the connotation of social type, maybe in navigation. These are the sign functions I've been distinguishing. And, um, and in the end, it's all about distributing and, 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 and all this manifold of communicative situations which contemporary society consists of to kind of somehow distribute that and unfold that and connect it and make that navigable and available to all of us so that we can find each other in and get brought into particular constellations so that we have specific relevant communications to go through. Um, so for instance, the difference in the universities between a lecture, a seminar, a workshop and the library is all oriented to one, all oriented to all, many oriented to many, all separated from all. So these are the kind of, let's say, on the level of abstraction, uh, gives you clues how, you, how maybe to structure these different types on a kind of organizational level. And then you can kind of encode them through additional uh, uh, semiotics, if you like. And what I'm now going to do is, uh, the final step is, how am I actually working on this? I've been showing you these images, I've been labeling, uh, you know, what is the different types of functions we can write into the spaces. But this is quite of uh, tedious and also makes it difficult to overcome stereotypes. So I'm writing here's a kind of foyer, here's a kind of 
half foyer, which is uh, which is more intimate and 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 has is only for students, and the other one is for. So I have to write a lot. I want to be quite nuanced and different, and it kind of keeps migrating. So it becomes very difficult to work on, and keep track of. And uh, anyway, I found a way to integrate the meaning level into the model and work on the model with what it's all about, namely the, in, the nuanced interaction scenarios and the behavioral dispositions and biases and, and event scenarios which I call the meaning and ultimate purpose and destiny of these spaces because we as architects using space, the purpose is to order social communication, to frame and order social communication. So, and to show that, I'm saying we can actually do that now by bringing into the model the meaning of all these uh, spaces and, and, and features and distinctions and forms and materialities by crowd modeling. I can now bring the domain of the signified, the meaning domain, into the architectural model in the form of crowd and agent modeling. So <clears throat> I'm saying, I mean, th these different patterns and and, and interaction scenarios, <clears throat> in this case, there's a kind of rather unstructured environment, but there's still demarcation line objects and so on. This, this kind of gathering and structuring. And this is what, what we want to kind of bring into the model. The architecture here is quite neutral, but of course it will also be uh, 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 more details where we start to look at how people react to environmental features and how their behavior and the overall event is ordered by that. The technology is available to architects at the moment primarily in terms of technical efficiency of evacuation of, of streaming. It's a kind of um, uh, mainly an issue at the moment uh, of engineering doing traffic flows doing evacuation flows uh, for fire and so, so on. So it's kind of fluid dynamic of crowds. That's what has been done at the moment in, in, in the context of architecture. And we do that more and more in our projects and airports and train stations. But it's not really about the life process. It's only in the, in the event of the, of the fire. But you can see here that the capacity of these tools is quite powerful. Large groups even you can differentiate different characters and types and I mean you can play with that so there's a whole kind of a computational power of simulating crowd behaviors and that's the way we can integrate um, and here again it's a kind of primarily about evacuating a space and so on which is boring but I'm saying simulate all the life processes all the institutions all the communication scenarios and, uh, and, and the capacity is being built up at the moment. So, and we've done little studies already, like a few years ago, you can, you can simulate human uh, behavior with very simple automatons when it comes to circulation. For instance, here you can see here how the, the two groups stream against each other and they order themselves into laminar flow, into left and right. There's a spontaneous symmetry breaking and a kind of seemingly intelligent behavior, which is purely a kind of emergent order. Now, if I go to the next one, and you have an opening, and then you have also experienced this in an underground, that you have, you have the two streams separating into left and right, and here you have them separating into a before and after, which is also, if you observed a narrowing point, you have crowds coming, there's kind of orders in time, before and after. Now, these are still in the domain of simple, circulatory flows and getting a handle on that. But this is what our students can do. They did this in, in, in half a day after they've heard about the phenomenon. And it is very simple. And, um, and now we're going a bit further. We, we actually have new tools, for instance, a Maya plugin called MyArmy, usually for the gaming industry. Where, and Massive, another tool for where you can, you can have different characters and different collective behaviors, and again, at the moment, this is just people reacting to people. But what is important, how people react to environmental clues, and the people-to-people -people relation changes relative to environment they're in. So here it's again only a group of people 
uh, moving through a, an opening, etc. So this is just warming up, letting the students, uh, and, and, and because this is not what we're doing in the office, this is the kind of research I'm doing at the AA and other uh, at the uh, studios. And we're moving into more interesting things. We're moving into so-called functional crowds. So that it's not just generic bodies moving and keeping kind of distance and, and so on and, and jamming together, but different settings now triggering different behaviors, different communicative behaviors to do with the furniture, with the, with the, with the, with the texture of the surface. And this is research which is done, uh, in fact, uh, in the, also in the game industry context because you want to create scenes in which automatons, agents, in fact, are behaving. You don't have to do a frame-by-frame -frame simulation. You just let agents roam through your environment and they will do the appropriate thing because they can read the influence by the environmental clues. And that's what we're going to work on. That's what we do. We want to simulate you know, cocktail party. We want to f simulate a scenario where you go to a party, you start with a cocktail, then kind of... Uh, there's a little stage, the host makes a speech, there's a reorientation, then you move on to a kind of bar situation, dinner situation. After dinner, kind of informal uh, sit down with intimate communication. There's a whole differentiated unfolding of nuanced communication scenarios and it's been a good event if you had met, met lots of new people, some of them you were able to get into deeper conversation <coughs> and then you had a kind of uh, uh, some, some very kind of intense conversations in a, in a corner, and so you need to have corners. You need so the, the point here is how to work with this. And again, we're using different tools to start to look at flocking, look at how attraction points in space, entry points make a difference. And you, the problem here is to, to actually evolve a satisfying, intense, enriching communication scenario by using just the space to order and program the actors by giving them behavioral clues. And I think we all can learn and we move into a new environment. We know that we can be given, uh, you know, uh, rules. We can be given dispositions. When we enter a space where we open a door, we kind of calm down, be quiet down. We know how to behave. And, and we started to introduce kind of architectural actors into the mix and this is again more like fluid, this is old stuff, so it can work on different levels of abstraction. And uh, just... Wait. Now we have, put, we, 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 we're introducing kind of um, uh, architectural actors that don't need to move themselves, but they could move as well. And so you have a little bit of behavior that you gather around such an object. And these are not animations which are frame by frame. These are autonomous let loose in, in an environment, right? So, and you're trying to, uh, first of all, get a handle on uh, different dispositions, how the people react to each other and relative to an object, to an architectural attractor. You start with very simple things of people recognizing each other and, and approaching each other, sitting down. I mean, it's, it's very, very basic, but we're starting to introduce uh, architectural uh, features. And there's a certain, there's certain chance. It's not deterministic. There's a certain bias only. Uh, it's not that things have to happen, but there's a likelihood of things happening. It's, uh, if you have a counter somewhere in a corner and there's a likelihood of one standing, somebody else gathers and connects. And this is, gets more interesting. So here we're saying um, you can inscribe um, biases, for instance, with giving the floor different zoning or different textures. So the blue areas are the ones where you might kind of slow down and gather, and the red areas where you keep circulating. So you can encode behavior, uh, and therefore the environment is ordering the overall global pattern based on the local individual dispositions 
and rules, meanings you give to the different um, features. So here we have another scenario where you have a market or something. So the different textures of the floor uh, imply different speeds of movement. So the, the fast movement is in the middle and the slower movement to the edge. So you can kind of generate potential for additional activities at the edge, etc. And this way you can experiment in your model with meanings, with dispositions, and you can generate and work on an overall uh, scenario in which the architectural order is uh, critical in ordering the event. And again, if you observe it, you can see what's going on, what, how the different zones solicit different behavioral dispositions and better. So the, the, the actor changes his behavior as he crosses thresholds. As he crosses that threshold, it kind of speeds up, let's say. I mean, these are very simple models, but I think they... Or you can, you can have topography and, 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 and make topography do work of ordering the situation. And here it is most clear, perhaps, that you have, uh, as the new territory is encountered, behavior changes. And the interesting thing is here that the, the territories themselves can be shifting and moving and adapting. So you could have a dialectic between different territories and listening different uh, behaviors, but also you can shift the territories around either by kinetics, by opening and, and closing divisions, or by simply that perceptual reconfiguration I was talking about earlier. So here you have the kind of the very powerful paradigm of how the environment and maybe even a dynamically learning and adapting environment is structuring behavior. And this is the idea that you also might leave traces. So there might be an interactive environment where the actors leave traces, there's trace following, maybe that is a, is a certain time factor, and kind of, there's an interaction now between an, an environment which, deter, which kind of um, structures behavior, and then the behavior in turn restructures the environment. There's a whole dialectic, a whole kind of uh, evolutionary process. And you could also see here that there could be a kind of interactive correlation between environmental elements and um, behavioral elements. And so we're working on this kind of responsive environments which, which kind of reconfigure based on behavior and then kind of restructure a new behavior. So. We've done that kind of many years ago with, with, with these simple models where we're trying to anticipate how an object could be reconfiguring and changing uh, the, the kind of social diagram as it kind of interacts with users. But at that time we kind of thought through the behavior and, 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 and made the kind of frame by frame sketch, whereas today we're actually working with autonomous agents. With, 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 where we, 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 only, we have to observe what they do, they do to some extent what they want according to particular biases. So here they're just orient by the wall or here they... It's very primitive stuff of course still, but here the wall flattens down and becomes a kind of place to sit down. So from now on I'm saying I want to develop my architecture always in that interaction, in that kind of sense where, where I'm conscious and aware of um, the fact that uh, what I'm really trying to do when I lay out these spaces, when I articulate these spaces, I want to give clues, I want to give behavioral clues, I want to ha think of actors socialized to read the environment, to individually behave, but then creating a collective outcome. And I can do that now in ways which are more nuanced as well. Like there's different ways of walking, I might be strolling in a different way in a public space from a kind of more intimate space. When I move onto the carpet, I'm kind of slowing down I'm, and so on. 
um, yeah, so that's the project in terms of um, bringing kind of uh, the societal function of architecture, pushing that, understanding that, and upgrading that technologically and making a, a new project on a new level of sophistication. So uh, thanks for your attention, and I'm, I'm also available for dialogue and questions now. Thanks. Uh, it's called parametricism, right? Yep. But I wouldn't agree that all these projects that are shown here are 100% parametric because they're static. When the parameters, they change, like, like the sun, like people flow, it's always different. When what we see here is, is not changing. I mean, the architectural context can change. The building can be demolished around... So are you thinking of upgrading to the level of responsiveness, of interaction? Yeah, that's my question. Yes, yes. Um, we had a re three-year research program and s project that the AADRL where I'm teaching called Responsive Environments a while ago. So that is a capacity we should think about. Now, every architecture has some degree of kinetic capacity. But I make the distinction parametric design is not necessarily equivalent to kinetic design. So all buildings have doors, they have lights switching on and off, windows closed and open and so on, curtains drawn, partition walls. These elements need to be looked at, I agree with them, there's an important layer. But it's much, first of all, most of it will still remain fixed to a large extent. The road network, the urban morphology, uh, the main structure of the building, so we, we can't escape from the fixity, and parametric is not equal kinetic. I'm interested in the kinetic layer. It's the final layer, and I think it should be part of that semiotic system, and part of an interaction, and, and a dynamic uh, 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 part of the architecture. But these buildings, although they're not um, moving, they are, they are parametrically variable because al as you move along, the environment keeps changing. In the station, as you move from one station to another, it all looks different and is readapted to the conditions of the environment. So in this sense, it's parametric, even if it's fixed. And most of what we will do will be fixed. And uh, we need to understand the power of how it creates a complex order and differentiated order and kind of an order where I can also understand how it responds and resonates with elements around it. So usually if you put a new building in there, it should kind of resonate and tell you what's beyond its ambit as well. That's the, the, the parametric. But the kinetic is, is, is important, but not something to focus on only, for sure. Uh, you are talking about uh, confrontation between uh, um, minimalism, uh, sorry, uh, between uh, parametricism and uh, modernism. Yep. Uh, also against minimalism, you're quite right. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, f um, uh, modernism is dead. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not truth, but... Uh, well, I mean, you have, of course you have some people who are still working in this way, Right? You have somebody like Chip, oh, minimalism, like Chipperfield, for instance. Uh, he is still working uh, like a modernist. Uh, that means he is happy to have worked with rigid stereotypical figures, to have endless repetition. He is, doesn't want to differentiate. He doesn't want to be sensitive to context conditions. Yes, you have people who do that, but I'm saying we have a more sophisticated, a more nuanced and high performance way of handling urban sites. And therefore, I think modernism intellectually is dead. Of course, there's still some, you know, there's still <coughs> uh, um, people who might be uh, not up to the level of their own discipline, as it were. They haven't understood fully where the discipline has gone and evolved to, 
and therefore they're not participating. But intellectually, I would argue uh, modernism is dead. Hi. Thank you for the great pre presentation. Uh, in terms of production costs and uh, b building time, what can you, what can you say about uh, that approach in comparison to more tr traditional? You mean construction time? Yes, I mean c c construction time and construction costs. Costs, costs yeah, yes. okay. Um, I think there is, a, of course, that at the moment it still takes somewhat longer uh, to design, first of all, because you, you're trying to be more intricate, you're trying to be more sensitive to conditions, you're trying to be more nuanced. Uh, so you, uh, there's more intelligence in the project. It takes longer to kind of think that through. Now, in terms of, uh, and the same is there's more complexity later on to fabricate the parts more difficulty in construction, but I think the, uh, th these, the difference is kind of decreasing with every year, because for us it, it takes more time, more on the thinking and time, not more drawing time, because if we have a parametric model, uh, uh, we produce all the drawings of the model, and if the floor is 50 times the same, or it's 50 times different, it doesn't matter, change our capacity. If we lay out the panels of our project, it's all a script, picking them off the model and laying them out and folding them. It's all, all so it doesn't take longer for us in that level. And if you work with sophisticated construction companies who work with uh, robotic fabrication and you, they also have 3D capacity and they, it is also, of course, it is kind of becoming a diminishing difference. So uh, oftentimes the kind of cost uplift uh, uh, facade which has 100 equal pieces versus 100 different pieces is not much. And I think in a few years time when, ev when all industrial construction companies are fully invested uh, in these new technologies, there will be virtually no difference. And in fact, the costs could come down because if you like, for instance, in our Wolfborg space frame, a usual engineering with the manufacturing constraint would make all members of the space frame the same. That means they would look at a critical piece, dimension that, and then repeat that piece across the thickness of the beam, across the whole thing. So the thing will be much more heavy and more material consuming. And in this way, because we can be more at nuanced adaptive to individual conditions, the same with Brissolet and louvers. We only make them to the extent that they're needed and then they fade off. Whereas in a modernist sensibility, you most probably would do the louvers everywhere. So in the end, it could be even cheaper. Not at the moment yet, but soon. Good evening. Uh, how do you see the future of parametrism? The future of what? Of parametrism. Well, I see. Uh, I think that there's um, a global movement. I see kind of schools of architecture around the world. I see a lot of interest in China, in Beijing, and Shanghai, and other in Hong Kong. People working and a lot of projects already. Not only our project, but other younger architects' projects working in this way in China. So China is a great a pole of pushing this work. Um, and I think uh, that uh, the economic crisis of the last few years has slowed down a little bit the progress. And I think once we're coming out of the crisis, it will be accelerating again. A lot of people thought that uh, this kind of complex work, we can no longer afford it, we should go back to simplicity and so on because of the economic crisis. That has, I think, slowed down a little bit. But I think we have to think of the longer term development of a civilization and I believe that this work will become the global state-of-the-art best practice. You would demand from any architect to be able to use this level of intelligence and, and, and adaptive capacity and differentiating capacity. You wouldn't want to have somebody just make a crude box or 
an endlessly repetitive urban field. I think that will become, I think it will, it will succeed as a kind of um, state of the art intellectual and method in terms of methodology to work like this. And then, of course, it has an enormous creative potential. I don't think it will be a kind of boring, everybody's doing the same, because in that paradigm, as I accept, there's so many ways to transcode information, so many different formal systems you could invent, so many ways to differentiate, so many ways to correlate subsystems. It's very abstract and open. So I believe that there will be a series of subsidiary styles and movements within that and very original careers within that. Because the very original field, very new, in which has a lot openness for further invention. Whereas in minimalism, it's been, you know, there's, the, t the stone has been turned so many times, I don't think you could make anything particularly original there. And anything, it's a wrong historical trajectory. So I see a, a great kind of proliferation of original architects of movements of subsidiary styles. Like modernism had a number of subsidiary styles. It, has not, it started with the white modernism, then became kind of brutalism, interest in materiality. It became metabolism, high-tech, quite different, but they're all modernists. They all work with in terms of separation, specialization, and repetition. All of these sub-styles. And I think that parametricism has a much more rich future than modernism. And I think it will be uh, regionally adaptive, so it could be a global style much more uh, convincingly than modernism. Modernism, in a sense, was exported its models into different regions of the world, undifferentiated, not taking account of local conditions, climates, etc. It was just that glass box with a kind of air conditioning machine which you could kind of drop anywhere. That's not our sensibility. Our sensibility is that we're looking at closely adapting to local climates. We don't do glass buildings in the south. We're trying to use, work with passive systems, be environmentally adaptive, being socially adaptive, variable. So I think it will be also much more, it will be a global and universal best practice in terms of principles. Uh, it's like there's one science, but it will apply itself with a much more local sensitivity. So there will be regional substrands and so on. Uh, so I think that's, that's also a much richer paradigm and, and movement than modernism was. But modernism was the first global st style which really in took hold of the totality of the built environment globally, everywhere. And that will also be the case with parametricism. But it will be much more context-sensitive, uh, culture-sensitive, climatic-sensitive. Спасибо за презентацию, она была великолепна. Вопрос такой, не считаете ли вы параметризм немножко надуманным названием? Вы все время говорите о интерактивности, о взаимодействии. Не считаете ли вы, что параметризм является лишь частью интерактивной архитектуры и его инструментом? Это первый вопрос. Второй, что вы, как вы считаете, как может развиваться ваша архитектура в том случае, если ваш скрипт будет ошибочным? Ну и в сравнении простая форма может быть ошибочна. Ваша форма, как бы сложная, интерактивная, тоже может быть ошибочной. В чем разница и как вы видите ее адаптацию к изменениям? Спасибо. Thanks. Um, yes, it seems to be. Uh, you could argue that some of the um, particular complexity of the form, which takes up, you know, context-specific situations, program-specific articulations, etc. There is a kind of potential contradiction with openness and flexibility, right? So the more determinate the form, the less seems to be flexible for the future. And to some extent, there is always that choice. Um, but if you think this through radically, you, you, would have, you would end up with, a, with an undifferentiated neutral space, which in theory could be anything, but in fact can be nothing. And what we are doing, and it's also always just one object, you can have a kind of urban grid with one empty box all over, it facilitates nothing, it creates no identity, it stimulates nothing. So what we are doing is 
we have in complex variegated form, some of it is determined and thought through with particular agendas we know about, but other parts of that differentiation is just open, just creating 100 different things, not knowing yet. For instance, if you do an urban field, the modernists would make 100 blocks the same, we would make the 100 blocks very different, from very small to very large and everything in between. Maybe we don't know if there's a use for the very small and for the three-quarter size, but we're just offering something much richer to the market and let the market appropriate and decide. And then we change our parametric model to, f to follow the market. And anyway, even with the new uses, the change of society, the, the society is always 100 different things to find, to appropriate, to use. It's better than only one thing. So it could be non-specific differentiation as well, which is quite open and flexible to different uses, different appropriations. And we can be much more, in a sense, testing the market. Maybe even people didn't know that they could like some strange form which is in the mix. So we're also stimulating discovery of people's interests, kind of creating found objects. So we, we're accepting, it's not about the, only about the very detailed determinism of specificity of forms. There's some of that, but there's also looseness and just nearly random differentiation so that people have the chance to discover strange environments and appropriate them. It's like an aleatoric appropriation which we're also thinking about. Uh, there's, that's the kind of dialectic. So we believe that you can have a lot of flexibility in a very rich environment because it can stimulate lots of interpretations. It's a bit like if I give you um, a kind of random painting of ink blots and patterns or water marks on a wall it stimulates the imagination. You can create 100 different beautiful paintings out of that because there's a kind of stimulation of an active discovery process. So that's also to be considered. I want to ask you about uh, the organic component. You mentioned about the natural organic component like sand dunes, behaves, and uh, are these the mainstream of your inspiration or for you personally, uh, where do you get your inspirations from? Um, yes, original, yes, that was the first kind of wave of inspiration to think can the built environment be more like a landscape meaning or natural environment where you have transitions, gradients, where it's not just the building from here it's an interior, a sharp line, then there's the exterior or here is one surface uh, one part of the city, cut another part. In nature you have a kind of more smooth transitioning. The hills become slowly the mountains, the vegetation gradually changes, um, uh, etc. There is kind of uh, uh, soft transitions, blurred boundaries, etc. So that was an inspiration that's quite true. But more importantly is that now with the computational simulations we re when the, when the, when we, you realize that these natural environments, they are, they are the result of a complex, dynamic, rule-based interaction of matter and elements, particles, like the river eroding through a landscape, the way it erodes the stone, the way it flows in the lowest parts, etc. So there's a lawful process, laws of nature, which produce something which later on when you look at it, you, you register its orderedness. It has laws and inscribed in it. And this became a kind of paradigm, a general paradigm. No longer necessarily going to individual features like dunes and imitating those, for instance. But more about appropriating that general principle of a kind of rule-based formation where you give elements and structures and components laws of association that became more important so it becomes more abstract at the same time you of course you have biomimetic research you can still also learn particular interesting 
things, for instance, structural systems from the fiber logics of trees. The way the tree is able to branch off a large branch without ripping it off the trunk. The way it has to do with the way the fibers are laid uh, and, and redirected into the branch. Uh, and that kind of detail logic you can learn from that or you learn from uh, particular organisms how they uh, keep kind of temperature stable relative to a changing environment and you, you, you learn from that. And what we recently done, so the, there's not only general principles, also specifics you can learn. That's kind of biomimetics which is used not only in architecture but also in engineering a lot. And we also looked now at, interestingly, we're we, we, we researching not only organisms but early vernacular traditional architectures where they had not so much a capacity to kind of bulldoze the land, where they didn't have air conditioning, for instance, where they, where they had to adapt more passively through natural environments, and they're quite intelligent because of centuries of trial and error, developed an interesting, intelligent local building logics, environmentally, materially, and so on, and you can sometimes retrieve that, this understand it through science and then utilize it again. So there's some interesting research also there, looking at the vernaculars of this world and retrieving this intelligence, not to imitate, imitate directly, but to learn principles. Good evening. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, you almost answered my question, <laughs> but uh, okay, continuing the theme you're talking about, um, that first, this old style is based on using a new tool, then it's aesthetic, and the still I can't understand the like philosophy of functioning, I can't see something revolutionarily new in that. It, personally, for me, it's kind of unclear, especially on the urban projects. It's kind of, I don't know, creating, for me, it's like Disneyland lifestyle. You know, this is how I see, I mean, uh, you're articulate and searching for inspiration and how you like articulate the space, de designed it. It's more about using the tool and um, Aesthetics, aesthetics, and you know, communication, and so on, so on. But then, I mean, uh, li living in the, for example, all this uh, urban patterns you showed, I mean, functioning like when all everything is collaborating, going from one space to another, and isn't it unnatural in that way? I mean, repeating naturally patterns, but that's actually just, I mean, I don't know how to ask him. Yeah. It's like uh, unnaturally way of living. I mean, people are used to be separated as well and communicate, like be together in one moment. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm quite excited about the fact that it looks so other, so different. <laughs> and I think that it's a question of sensibility. I mean, I, I, I advocate a sensibility where we should be uh, curious about what humanity and human civilization could become in the next stages. Not thinking about there's something particularly natural about a particular way of life. I think what you find natural is maybe something which only existed for, the f f for, for 50, 60 years uh, and it became normal, but it's not natural to the human race. I mean, the human race biologically is an ape. So, and you, you, how artificial have we become, not only in the future, but already, where we're living with, with mobile phones and internet and, and, and clothes and flying across continents and, and being on, on, you know, watching television and channel hopping. And so, 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 so we living with all these prostheses and systems. Uh, it's already so super artificial to what we are biologically, namely a kind of flock of apes, ultimately. <laughs> I'm curious to what's ne what else can we become. And I think, I don't think, of course there are some ultimate biological and psychological constraints. But I'm more fascinated to look at the diversity of lifestyles which have existed 
if you look at anthropology, they're also in terms of human relations, social relations, the kind of uh, uh, monogamic nuclear family, uh, um, um, f starting that at the age of 30 and so on, and getting through two divorces, whatever. That seems normal and natural now, but there's been so many other patterns and, uh, uh, throughout history where there was even a period where you had, had group marriage and you didn't even know who the father of your child was, for instance. So I'm kind uh, of a utopia, no story. So, so I'm inviting yeah. you to think of, look at all the, how radically different uh, humans have existed and lived in history and in different continents and how radically we've evolved and how artificial all of this is, including, uh, let me find this image, I mean, um, I'll get to it in a minute. How natural is that? Hundred <laughs> percent. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> it's totally artificial. <laughs> and I'm curious how we as designers can be kind of creative to create the next level of artificiality in the next 50 years. Yeah, but then you're talking about changing mentality and uh, like other way around. I, I mean, think the, our mentalities are radically uh, changing. Yeah, now, now I see your point, but I, I understand that I'm totally disagree from the beginning <laughs> about talking about human beings. So I have a second question. It's, um, it's uh, in a way funny. I, I'm just wondering how your own home looks like. Is it endless? If, if it's endless, I'm convinced totally. <laughs> I would, I would, I hope I could afford my own work, to be honest. <laughs> so uh, that's the problem. Uh, but yeah, I would love to live in this kind of stuff uh, we're designing. Okay. I would absolutely adore it. And because you could have a great social life, you could have a great, throw great parties. That's what I would like to do. But I'm living in a kind of scruffy loft in Shoreditch. But I still want to be in the middle of a, you know, a cent urban center. And uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Could you tell uh, how many architects uh, uh, works in uh, that style in the world and uh, particularly uh, in Russia? Say it again. I didn't catch it. Могли бы вы сказать, сколько архитекторов работают в этом стиле в мире и в частности в России? I don't know exactly how many, but I'm, I, I know that there is uh, some of this happening in Russia, uh, like in every country. Uh, I haven't been here f recently, so I would be curious to go a bit around. I mean, I've been in Iran, for instance, recently. I went to Tehran and Isfahan, and there have been workshops there, and, and there have been quite a few architects working in, with parametric tools, working within the paradigm of parametricism, surprisingly, both in Tehran and Isfahan. And I'm working on a big exhibition at the moment, which will take place in London at the end of uh, 2014, which is parametricism, the new international style, uh, also including design and uh, architecture. So I would actually like to know uh, what there is in Russia. I'm sure there, is, there are some people, I've seen some stuff. Uh, I think it's happening everywhere. Um, like in places in, in Iran, curiously, of course, all over Asia, uh, in, in the Middle East and Egypt, in all European countries. Um, I, somehow not at Strelka, I see, it seems. I don't know. Maybe that needs to change as well. I have uh, the qu a question. Um, was you ever think about um, building theater? Building theater, which will uh, which would um, provide provide a new way of performance, because um, the architecture you present is sort of about movement, and um, I know that there were attempts in the beginning of the last century of like Kiesler and something else like move, uh, movement theater, endless theater, yeah. and I think that the, this architecture would be um, I I don't know um, sort of where audience would have a chance to move and performers will have a chance to move as well and also 
So it will be a scenario of movement between audience environment and performance environment. Uh, was you ever thinking about this and uh, yeah, yeah. what do you think about such type of theater architecture and what do you feel when you come to the theater uh, and look at the proscenium uh, set design and yes. Well, <laughs> I, I agree with you that uh, the, the scenario you're pointing out would be in line with the kind of spirit of this kind of architecture to have something which is not so rigid as an institution with going into this room sitting down and then two hours with one action so it is it would be something uh, um, um, it's still happening of course and 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 usually if you go now to a theater you expect a bit more you have an intermission you have formal in communi communication you, in the intermission and afterwards there's a kind of restaurant like uh, connected to that and so on so there is a little bit more going on at the at your evening out to the theater but i agree that of course there's contemporary discourse about making that more rich and complex and diverse situation with particular with audience uh, participation or multiple plays at the same time etc so that that you get more out of your evening than um, this this kind of one 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 thing yeah i agree with that i mean we didn't we didn't have a um, uh, a theater at the moment and we've done an opera and to some extent it's a shame that um, Yes, we would like to have an institution or a client who is very dynamic and forward-looking and experimental also on the program side because that's where we push our clients to as well. So um, I, I like your idea. Thanks. Добрый вечер. Извините, я буду говорить по-русски. Я слишком волнуюсь для того, чтобы говорить по-английски. Добрый вечер. Я слишком волнуюсь, чтобы говорить по-английски, поэтому придется воспользоваться услугами переводчика. Скажите, пожалуйста, вот в последнее время и у вас в том числе используется довольно много математических продуктов, каких-либо тоже для Хоппер, в тот же самый скрипт для Май. А скажите, а как вы думаете, возможно ли, что человек архитектора когда-то заменит архитектор компьютерный, хотя бы для каких-то типовых проектов? Спасибо. Um, I think the, the way this will work in the future, I mean, now it's new, there's nobody, it's the burden on the young architects and architectural students to learn these new tools, develop new skills, um, learn to script, and it's also a new way of thinking thinking in terms of differentiation, correlation, associative logic, thinking in terms of agents and agent-based uh, configurations. Th that's necessary, but in the end, I think uh, there will also be specialists which will help us and the designers. And in the end, the designer is somebody who choreographs a group of specialists and uh, some of this will be a support team, like used to, we used to have drafting people to help with, and it's already happened with the kind of complexity of, of programming, of computation and so on. So it will be a mixture of people, and we already, when it becomes more sophisticated, we are, we are working with mathematicians, uh, specialists in computational geometry, when it goes to kind of sophisticated fabrication, and uh, uh, geometric optimization. They're actually now ex starting to exist specialized math mathematician firms, little firms, specialists in machinic fabrication and electronic working drawings. So we work with them. Then you have, I think we, the, the discipline will attract programmers, scripters. Some of you and uh, some of us have learned to program and script but we, I think it will be more and more relying on additional expertise because we are, in the end, we're designers and we're not um, uh, computer scientists. Thank you.